Welcome back to the third installment of traditions and should we do them or not from the Jewish side of things and uh, our resident expert Scott is here. Hey Scott. I think you're uh, muted again although it doesn't say that you're muted. New messages received from Robert H. Eisenman. And then Jackson said he had something to start here. So I'll go ahead and let him jump into yeah, it. A couple of things. Well, the second thing was the, um, the video somebody put up on Facebook in regards to the altar. But first, I haven't been to a very few, if any, Messianic synagogues. Just, uh, let's see, I've been to a reform once and some Hebrew roots type groups, but that's about it. I got a pet peeve. I'm almost afraid to say it, but I'm bugged about the Torah scroll. Marching with the Torah scroll and kissing the scroll. I know it's supposed to be kissing the sun in a way, but it just almost seems idolatrous to me. I can't participate in that. I don't feel right with my spirit. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I just throw that out to the panel of experts here. It seems like uh, they're giving too much benevolence to an object, almost a graven image here. I don't know if you've experienced it or not, but like I said, I don't I hardly ever go to any. But this is something I felt very uncomfortable with. Is your audio on, Scott? Yeah, we can't hear you talking again. So I don't know what that is. Has anybody, I've, uh, I've been to uh, one service when... Um, when they were doing the procession with the scroll and everything, I would agree with Jackson. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, uh, you know, for the same reason that I'm not a big fan of singing a song about the cross, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's this uh, sort of weird sort of giving paying homage or worth to an object rather than, rather than the father or the son or, you know, what they, you know, stand for. But um, anyone else have any thoughts on that? Has anybody participated in a Torah scroll procession? They seem all seem really all happy. I have. Happy about it. John has here. <clears throat> yeah, I've been uh, to some services where they've done that. Well, what do you think about it? Were you uncomfortable? Well, I think that the the backdrop of that practice is based upon uh, the Judaism uh, exclusion of Messiah. I think that it puts the Torah uh, in a position that Messiah should be in. Um, I don't believe Torah should be excluded, but um, the living Torah is the focus that we should be um, fixating on rather than uh, the Torah as a um, as a written record and document which tells us uh, ways in which we can model our lives, uh, but all ultimately through the direction and life-giving force of the Master. So um, I don't let it become a distraction necessarily if there are those who do that um, I, I, it's not i suppose one of my pet peeves uh you all probably know my pet peeves by now I certainly oh have yeah uh, but um the thing is is that uh, i think that it could be diminished um if I had my druthers, but at the same time, if they believe in Yeshua, I'm not going to, you know, make it a major 
uh, it sort of is relegated to the minor category. I put it on the back burner, so to speak, of my own uh, re now, regarding them. Consider this, Greg. There's one leader who translate a Bible, and he translates John 1, yeah. 1, something like this. In the beginning was the Devar, and the Devar is with Elohim, and Elohim was the Torah. It's a popular Bible. I'm sure yeah, you've read it. Um, well, Devar That's means exactly word, right. word thing. Word well, you thing. know, using uh, God was the word. Now we've got something that's relating to the uh, metaphysical word here. We understand is Yahshua, and I think the, the writer does too, but all of a sudden, that word is replaced with Torah. Right. Yeah, I, get, I know where they're coming from. They're, they're trying to bring the notion of the living Torah together, oh. uh, based upon the Messiah who said, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. And he talks about that I'm the light of the world. And if you go into the Torah, um, every single one of those elements the Messiah identified himself as is identified as the Torah. So that's where they get that. They sort of string all those concepts together, and they put that translation together like that. So, well, do they consider uh, Yahshua to be the living Torah? Is that it? Well, if they're a messianic, I think I know the, the translation you're talking about. Yeah, you uh, probably do. Uh, so if they're messianic, then what they're doing is they're, they're, they're taking that string of thought and applying that into the translation. And uh, so in other words, uh, they're creating a, an atmosphere where Yeshua and the Torah are united in its purpose. Uh, and, and, and it's with the goal to demonstrate that the uh, Hellenized Jesus is an incorrect manifestation. Uh, I think that's what probably are your thoughts on that. I, I agree. Do you think? Do you have that agenda as well? Yeah. Do you think that's correct? I do. Which one? That the Torah and Yeshua are completely the same in purpose, and that the Hellenized version of "quote unquote" Jesus is incorrect. Yes, I do. I think my position is is that Yeshua, being the very author of Torah, um, is united in purpose with yes. the precepts. We now, can hear you, Scott. Sorry, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, finally. I have to keep changing my settings because I'm on Skype, and I don't know what my computer does every time I switch. So. Okay, no worries. Go ahead, uh, Professor. Um, I th uh, the, the Torah itself being authored by the Messiah, uh, Aside from all of the records of the disobedience, I'm talking about the precepts contained within Torah. For example, the Sabbath. For example, care for the poor. For example, having respect uh, and uh, protecting the, uh, you know, integrity of the community. Uh, all of these precepts, these, these higher precepts in the Torah are synonymous with the mission of the Messiah because the Messiah authored them. So in a, in, from a um, mystical sense, there's a sense of truth to that, in my understanding. And so when you compare that to the Hellenized Jesus concept, which, as you know, uh, the, the Hellenized Jesus concept has been divorced from Torah. Uh, it's come under the myriads and multitudinous uh, rules that all of your denominations apply and then say that this is their Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Well, see, I think that the name Jesus comes legitimately. If you go through the, the five languages are involved here, and yeah, the, not, the masses yeah. don't know anymore anything, but I'm thinking specifically about is that 
a legitimate translation and is that can that be one of the reasons why the uh why say the jewish groups that do that kiss the torah scroll yeah okay i, I think that i think that that's what they're extrapolating if they are messianic the jews who are not messianic do so for a completely different reason they don't um there's no uh parallel with messiah uh they don't um in other words, Messiah Yeshua. Now, I, I'll agree with you on the term Jesus. Uh, the term in and of itself is a reasonable transliteration when you go through five languages. Yeah. Um, but I'm speaking as to the concepts, the things by which that name is portrayed amongst the people. Okay. So oh, how is yeah. it portrayed currently? It's portrayed... Uh, well, Sunday is the day we worship. Um, you can eat anything you want. You keep Christmas, Easter, Halloween. All of those are Hellenized Jesus concepts that are portrayed by the myriad multitudinous denominations in the West. So, so that's what I'm referencing. You're uh, kind of putting some prophetic aspect of that then. I don't. I wouldn't call it prophetic aspect that he's putting to it. I would call it, um, you know, subconscious adherence to. There's like a subconscious adherence to, and I think that that's true. You know, if people ask me, well, you know, do you think it's bad to go to church on Sunday? No, I don't. But I think it would be bad if they mandated that you must only rest on Sunday and worship on Sunday. That would be bad. So um, I think what he's saying is that there's this kind of subconscious and sometimes conscious push towards, you know, the opposite of what scripture teaches. And in that case, um, I would agree with him that I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, I would not adhere to that. However, I agree with him and you saying, you know, Jesus coming through uh, the five different languages, uh, I can see how it got there. I don't mind if somebody says Jesus, especially if I'm talking to them about something for the first time. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think they're evil or bad or anything like that. Is that what you're kind of getting at, Professor? Yeah, yeah. I'll even use the term itself to bridge the gap. And then as I get into my teaching, I'll, I will explain, well, this is, this is, we use Yeshua. Uh, and we use the name of the Father. Um, and so, you know, I'll give them Yehovah, usually. Um so, um, unless it's a group that's just so strong on Yahuwah, you know, I'll adjust to that. Um, I try not to let the minors get me, but the goal, the majors to me are syncretism, trying to root those things out. I'm going to sit up here. Here's John Smith. You want to sit here and say a word? He's got an opinion. Be nice, John. <laughs> I think um, uh, the Hellenized uh, uh, religion of uh, what's going on today is uh, incorrect myself because of like uh, Pauline Christianity um, puts it in a whole new different perspective than what uh, uh, its original, the original form was. Anybody? Yeah, uh, give us a couple examples of that from your perspective. Well, um, the early uh, followers of Yeshua uh, rejected Paul um, in Paulinian Christianity. Um, and Christianity today has been Hellenized uh, with Trinity doctrine and many other things that are disagreeable with the, what the early followers believed and followed. But can you prove that that came from <laughs> Shaul? That's uh, sir? Can you, but, but did that come from Shaul or just, uh, uh, you know, non-Jews that were coming in? Um, it kind of uh, came from both. Uh, it, uh, understand that uh, Hellenistic intentions in the, uh, in the, uh, what, what was, Excuse me. Uh, Hellenistic influences came in very early on in the uh, in the uh, early followers, and um, 
Um, I myself, like, um, I do not agree with Marion or uh, Paul's teachings. And I think that it's uh, hurt uh, the followers of today to follow by that Hellenistic influence, which is uh, really false. Because if the early followers did not uh, adhere to uh, Paul's teachings, um, and they called him whatever, uh, the, uh, whatever you understood, I understand that they pretty much called him the Antichrist. So, I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, uh, Paul is so great. Uh, it would not be Christianity without Paul, but that's not true. That's not true. Um, today, uh, the the movements of the early Christians are still visible today in a lot of different uh, places, in, like in Ethiopia. Hello? All right. Um, anybody got any uh, thoughts on that or pushback or same perspective? Anybody agree with him, disagree? That, that's a, uh, that is a, uh, a decidedly... Uh, uh, what's the term? Uh, what are the term? The guys, you know, that reject Paul, uh, Ebionite, Ebionite position, uh, so to speak. Now, uh, the other, uh, the other side of it is, well, the church took Paul's letters and misused it, but Paul, in its original, in his original writing, uh, affirmed the Torah, and so uh, you have two uh, sides here. Uh, you've got the people who say, well, it's just too difficult, and look at the effect of his writings throughout the centuries. And so we're gonna just relegate Paul as a false person. And the other side of the coin then says, well, yeah, um, we accept Paul as apostle uh, and his letters are intended to be interpreted in a completely opposite way that they are interpreted now in the churches. And that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, as he said, uh, but his letters have been misused and so, uh, the, on that side of the coin, you have probably the premier tome of knowledge, uh, which sort of uh, apologetically looks at Paul's letters from a Hebrew perspective. And I would say that that book is uh, all of the work that Avi Ben Mordecai has done with his Galatians first century uh, Hebraic commentary. And so those are the kind of tools that people on that side of the aisle use. And I count myself uh, in that crowd where I accept Paul, but I also recognize that he has been greatly mis misconstrued and misused uh, as the church got progressively less Hebraic in character throughout the centuries. Can I object to that um, finding? Because like Paul, what did Paul tell James uh, in the uh, sect of the circumcision? Told them that he would uh, rather they cut their genitals off that's not a very um let christian them mutilate themselves. let them mutilate themselves um that's telling the founding fathers that their doctrines are no good and that's opposite of what yeshua taught yeshua taught the torah he said not one jot not one tittle by no means no way shall be uh, done away with the torah so, and Paul writes that uh, we're free from the law. James writes back to Paul and tells him um, not, uh, not only by faith, but by faith by and works. Um, so there's a lot of discrepancies of what Paul had to say. Uh, and what he says, he misquotes the Torah many times. Um, uh, he's a very uh, sarcastic and says things to the early followers that are just not Christian-like, if you want to call it Christian. Could I pipe in here? This is Liz. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Hear yeah. yeah, I'd like to, this is a great discussion, and I'm really following it, and I appreciate everybody um, on this, but I would like to comment on that. You know, because that narrative, I think everybody, we're very familiar with the Paul narrative that you were just speaking of, and I just consider one of the narratives is getting a lot of airplay. I, again, with Professor Smith, I don't necessarily subscribe to that because I think there's a third even way to look at it. And if I could ask this question, I'd like to ask a question kind of directed towards Scott also, because one factor that I haven't heard in this discussion, which I think could be 
uh, interesting to put in there is the, is the concept of time. Because from what I understand, the rabbis or the sages break time down, you know, the, and Scott, you said the first two days, the middle two days, and now in the last two days, and day being as a thousand years, that these are different epochs. And that Messiah ben Joseph, if that's who we would call, would relate to the, Yeshua's first coming, it had very specific prophetic parts to it. It wasn't the whole, obviously, or we would be a millennium. We would be. It, it was a part of things that had to happen to put a full taku and a rest, rectification or restoration in process. So if these are the two <laughs> days of Messiah, because I understand that even the rabbis I've read a lot, that they call this the footsteps of Messiah, the Messiah. or the two days of Messiah. Yeah, that, that, that what I'm talking about is factoring into getting the lost sheep, getting the opening this door up during, and it is on a different level because obviously Paul knew and the <clears throat> disciples knew they got out of Jerusalem that the temple was going to go. That that period, uh, Judah was going into exile, so it was a whole different set of paradigms that was going to come into play. So, and Scott, I'd like your at, on what you think of this concept of the two days we're in now, having a different sort of set of prophetic boundaries around. Yeah, can I step in and say something about that? Um, you got to understand, um, a lie don't never become the truth. No matter how many years you put on that lie, it always will be a lie. And if he, it was a lie back then for them to say, I'm free from the Torah, that you was free from the Torah. Um, it hasn't changed to be the truth today. So we can't put uh, a whole a regiment of theology on what was a lie if it was a lie then. It's well, it's yeah, there's a couple ways to approach that. And just, I, I subscribe to exegesis called parts and there's different levels of understanding. Scriptures really have to, in order to ferret out the deeper mysteries or like to answer these big questions, to finally yeah. figure things out, you have to go into the level of the mysteries. You have to kind of go a little bit deeper. And I think Paul, this I mean, Paul's own admission was, he said, look, I'm going to be misconstrued. You know, he said, look, at, at the end of the church age, the church will be full of doctrines of demons. Many people, he, it was readily acknowledged that Paul's writings were not totally understood because he was such a deep thinker. He got things on such a deeper level. So my question back to Scott. Um, okay. Hey, you know, you got a huge question with all kinds of things in it. But um, whenever Paul, if you look, and the Greek word is mysterion, but uh you know, basically that translates as sod. So when Shaul, he says, behold, I show you a, a mystery. He's saying, I'm going on a deeper level than the Peshat understanding. So he talks about uh, the uh, man and his wife and, his, and the things that he should do. If you take that in just the literal sense, well, it's true and it applies, but he already said, I show you a mystery, a deeper meaning, and he's trying to say on the on another level, it's not invalidating the physical level of a husband and a wife, but he's saying it applies as Messiah and his bride. And so you're correct in that a lot of times Shaul, he, he says, this is an allegory, or this is a sod, and of course those were common rabbinic teachings that you would come out, if you're gonna use parables, then you're using Midrash, which is Darash. And uh, Paul did not use parables that we know of very often. Now Yeshua was a Haggadic rabbi, so he taught using parables in many instances. But Shaul, he basically took the Peshat and he taught in Ramez and he taught in Sod. So you're on, you're correct in that you have to understand Shaul from a different level. The second issue you have here is Paul's going out basically to the Gentiles and he's trying to say there's parts of the Torah that apply to the Jewish people and there's parts of the Torah that apply to the Gentiles. Now, that's where the problem comes in because you also have to understand the rulings and the understandings. Paul was of the school of Hillel and you had the school of Shammai. So James and those were of the school of Shammai. Paul was of the school of Hillel and they said, hey, we both believe in Messiah. We've got to solve this issue. What applies to the Gentiles? What applies to the Jews? 
we've had rulings by Beit Shammai that weren't in the Sanhedrin, but they had the majority of the Sanhedrin and they made decrees. In fact, uh, I have it right here. This is in uh, the Mishnah Seder Moed, volume one in the tractate Shabbat. And this records this. And these are the laws that they decreed in the upper chamber of Hananiah, Ben Hezkiahu, Ben Girion, when they went up to visit him. They voted in Beit Shemai, outnumbered Beit Hillel, and they decreed 18 matters on that day, which was, now you gotta learn what are in the 18 matters. It was a prohibition of Jews eating with Gentiles, regardless if they were a proselyte, if they were eating kosher. And so that's why those four categories of commandments were given for the Gentiles to be able to come in and worship with the Jewish people. But you see, Paul, he, he has Timothy circumcised because he's illogically Jewish, but Titus is a Gentile, and he says, no, he doesn't need to be circumcised. Now, today, there's a famous rabbi in Israel. I know him personally. He's a Lubavitcher. Um, his name is uh, Rabbi Avraham Greenbaum. He has a website, azamra.com. And he has studied all of the writings of Shaul. And he said, regardless of whether Rabbi Greenbaum believes Yeshua is the Messiah Ben Joseph or not, he said that every single halakhic ruling that Paul made in all of his writings is perfectly accurate according to his understanding of what applies to Jews and what applies to Gentiles. But the argument was, in those days, the, the school of Shammai, the school of Hillel, and that's why you say Shimon Kepha, he goes and eats with Cornelius, but then when he's with the other Jews, he's going, but, but uh, I've got to obey the, the decrees of Shammai. And so that was the argument that needed to be settled, and that's basically uh, uh, probably about half of what the book of Acts is dealing with. What applies to Jews? What applies to Gentiles? Oh, Scott, can you provide yeah, a link? Can you provide a link for that? Um, it's a Zamra A Z A M R A dot uh, com. Can you, can That's Rabbi it? Greenbaum's site. Okay, can you text that to Jackson? Uh, I forgot to open my uh, dialogue here. You know, and I didn't even I, I didn't do that last week, and here people are typing comments in, and I wasn't. Uh, um, and I, I understand what you're talking about that. I've done a lot of research on that. But you got to understand that was for the outer uh, sex. So when they would come in to the inner circle, they were, the rules would change. Well, well, they were debating whether to follow these edicts of Shammai or whether they should uh, um, just stick with um, you know, what had been decreed by the full Sanhedrin. Right. Um, well, them rules, uh, understand, they applied to the first, uh, the beginners, uh, but then they had to go through uh, ordination to become into the inner circle where there was different rules applied. Well, if you wanted to convert and become fully Jewish, then you were willingly, voluntarily saying, I want to. Uh, keep more of the commandments. I'm going to uh, right. go into that, but you didn't have to as a Gentile, and that was the argument of Beit Hillel. You know, um, he, they were saying the Gentiles have a position in the kingdom. Um, they don't need to go through and fully convert. Well, um, I, I, we're all trying to feel their way around. Hey, in previous times before the Messiah had come, you had to convert basically, right. but once Messiah had come, then they're trying to say, hey, <coughs> they believe that Yeshua is at least Messiah ben Yosef. And you even see that in the book of Yochanan. This would be, uh, um, I think it's chapter one, where the early believers are saying, you know, we have found him, the son of Yosef. Right. So they're they're acknowledging that Yeshua was had fulfilled the the prophecies of Messiah Ben Yosef, and that's the same thing that um, John the Baptist or Yochanan Hadmovil, 
he's in prison and you hear all these sermons, people saying, well, John's doubting. No, he knew that Yeshua was the Messiah. He's not doubting. He's asking the question, are you the Messiah or do we expect another? Then the answer Yeshua gives is, no, I'm fulfilling the roles of Messiah ben Yosef, but the one, I'm the one and the same Messiah that will return. And that's the division of the Jewish people today. They're acknowledging, many of them, that Yeshua is the Messiah ben Yosef, but they're saying, hey, from the Tanakh, we still need the messianic roles of Messiah ben David yeah. to be. They're not. They're not yeah. looking at the. They're not looking at the double uh, uh, coming of Yeshua. They're looking at one coming of a Messiah to fulfill Correct. all their roles, Many. and then they're losing out on the suffering servant. They're not paying attention to that part, but they say, "Well, he can't be the Messiah because of this over here," which. There was a double role of Messiah because he had to become the suffering servant first. Okay, well, that that's where you have to differentiate if you go back and look into Judaism from around the first temple era. They were expecting that, but okay. modern Judaism, because of the persecution, has basically thrown that to the wayside. But in modern Judaism, in just the last 30 years, they're starting to take another look they're reading their own writings from before. There were many sects that believed there'd be two messiahs, a prophet messiah, a king messiah, <coughs> but you also had people that believed in three messiahs, a prophet messiah, a priest messiah, and a king messiah. And uh, so you have to differentiate between what was believed in the first century, and you have to realize that modern Judaism is starting to take a second look. And that's part of the whole process of the the Moshiach redemption because you had the Moshiach redemption um, coming out of uh, Egypt, but they all the rabbis will say the Moshiach, the Messianic redemption, will be the greater redemption. And Jeremiah uh, chapter thirty one tells you that. That's right, thirty one, thirty one, actually. Yeah. And so, Scott, could you also just address the two days? Looking at this, so that if this is um, prophetically, the two days of Messiah ben Joseph gathering in those of the nations. So I, my question too would be, so it's, to me, this is the discussion, like what season are we in? Understanding now who we are, the two houses, getting this piece back together, people figuring out their role, but uh, how do we aid? What do you think would be the wiser way and how to bring about this whole uh, restoration? Like from Jew, how do you approach judah so to speak because i know they really are looking at it again it, it's amazing the way oh, the yeah. is, but uh and it's very beautiful but because my thing is you can't change the past we just have to, we've both been very bad <laughs> and there's a lot of uh repentance needed on both sides but that's water under the dam how what do you think is the bright future how are we gonna okay first of all um judaism separates like the ages now this isn't like Christianity where they say, you know, there's the age of law and grace. This isn't it at all. The first uh, 2,000 years, approximately, until the flood, it was called tohu, and it means desolation. And it, it means without um, a written Torah, without that. So once the Torah is given on Mount Sinai, they said that there would be two days of Torah um, instruction, and then there would be the days of the Messiah, or, or as you said, the footsteps of the Messiah, which is Ikvot Hamashiach. Okay, and so they're saying that, that from year 4,000 approximately, and Yeshua was born almost exactly in year 4,000 from the biblical uh, account, um, and there would be three days of Messiah, there'd be two days, and then there would be the Messianic kingdom. And so they're in anticipation knowing that the Messiah is about to come. In fact, if you go to Israel, I don't know how many of you have been, but there's billboards all over that say, Ba Mashiach, come Messiah. And, and you know, the days of the Messiah are about to appear. I mean, there's a, there's a, a I've been to Messianic. Orthodox congregations that are just on fire for the Messiah to come. I mean, they know it's the time. 
Right. So let me, my last one, and then I will bow out. So this, we're talking now Messiah ben David, because the way I look at it, the Jews have a different, the birthright and the blessing were split between Ephraim and Judah. And we've had different parts of this puzzle to perform. And I believe the Jews are much more the visible body, let's say, um, in that, you know, I won't get into all this, and, and it's a much more esoteric thing that's going on in the church today. But what do you think, uh, what is different about Messiah ben David that we could, you would say, we could really anticipate versus Messiah ben Joseph? Okay, Messiah ben David would be the gathering of all the remnants of Israel um, it, under the banner of the Messiah as king and as um under the Mishmarot of not only Melech Zedek, but the reestablishment of the temple, so that the, the Mishmarot of the course um, uh, of Melech Zedek, which means righteous king, would also work in tandem with the uh, priests or the Kohanim of the, the line of Zadok, and that they would work in tandem together. Um, there's, there's a lot more, um, like, I'll tell you what, almost all of Orthodox Judaism believes this, and this is from uh, a Siddur, it's in every Siddur, and it's going to be the 13 articles of faith of Judaism, and I'll, I'll just read one of them, but all of Orthodox Judaism believes this, maybe this will help. I believe with complete faith in the coming of the Messiah, and even though he delays, nevertheless, I anticipate every day that he will come. Okay, that's all of, all of Orthodox Judaism believes that. Amen. Right, so you could say they believe in the Messiah because it's oh, the same yeah. guy. I in mean, fact, in fact the Messiah, the Messiah is mentioned more in Judaism. If I go to just any service, I, I hear it more than any Christian service I've ever gone to. The anticipation of Messiah is there. Um, um, you could, but they, they are missing somewhat that Yeshua uh, could be the uh, one and same Messiah. Some of the Orthodox Jews will even say, well, Yeshua, is the, he's a legitimate Messiah for the Gentiles, but we're awaiting the Jewish Messiah because because the Jesus has been presented as a non-Jewish Messiah. You could uh, uh, show them that the temple fell. Uh, so the Messiah would come before the temple fell. So yes. right uh -huh. there, right there, uh, yes. pollutes their, it, it, it distorts their vision of what is reality about the Messiah and what is to come about the Messiah. That's why they're taking a second look, because they know he'd come before the second temple fell. So they're saying, maybe we missed it. I mean, I, it's unbelievable. Just in the last few years, Orthodox Judaism, many of the sects are really taking a second look. I mean, this is, that's what's telling me the Messiah is about to come. Um, I mean, their awesome. knowledge is, they're, they're taking a look at the beliefs and the writings that were done around the first century, and they're going, wow. I mean, Rabbi Akiva was a convert. A lot of people don't know that. He made a mistake in proclaiming Bar Kokhba a Messiah. But, uh, you know, you're starting to see that, wow, they're taking a second look. They anticipated the coming of the Messiah, but they missed it in Yeshua. Yeah. Uh, the uh, messianic expectations were before the temple fell, and now yeah. their messianic expectation is for the coming of the second return. But they're missing out on the first return because of the suffering servant aspect of the scriptures. Right, because, see, a Jew's going to read like Yeshiahu or Isaiah 53, and he's going to say the servant is Israel, Okay. And a, and a Christian's going to say, can't you see Messiah ben Yosef in that? Okay? But it's both. Both are true. The Messiah is part of true Israel, and he is a servant, but so is the nation. But not all of the nation, not all of the Jewish people. I mean, what, I bet 50% of the people in the church, you, you ask them, well, I'm a Christian, but are they real believers? Yeah, it's I'm the same I'm, way in Judaism. Are we any different? I'm not a Christian. I'm a follower of Yeshua. 
That's great. I don't believe uh, I'm not a, I, I, I couldn't call myself a Christian because that's a, a later title. To Correct. So, so, uh, you know, you can say, well, Christian, you know, that came from Christos from the Greek. And so you're right back into the same thing about is Jesus a legitimate name or is Christian legitimate? It depends on your definition. Yeah, we shouldn't get confused. Not a matter of the heart. A lot of people get confused with the names. Yeah. But uh, it's all the same person. Like I say God a lot. Um, sure. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I right. Mean, um, and I only say it for other people because uh, if I say Hoshua or uh, Yahweh or uh, back a long time ago, they, they didn't even know who I was. Who's Yahweh? Is that another God? So. I try to use that, that title. I don't get caught up in all the name thing either. I mean, as long as I know your intent is correct, right? I don't have a problem. I mean, we can argue about spellings. <laughs> yeah. When should you say the name and when shouldn't you and all of that? All I can tell you is the Jewish <coughs> people know that the Tetragrammaton will be pronounced in the temple. And when Messiah returns, it will be pronounced. In fact, the scripture even tells you that it won't be used for a while. And then um, when Messiah comes and Zechariah says, they will pronounce the glorious name of God. So when you're teaching, a Jew is going to say Hashem. When you're in prayer, you're going to use the term Adonai. But in the text, it has the Tetragrammaton, but it isn't pronounced in re because of reverence. That's um, the there's Jewish a Jew. There's a good link to that um, in the, uh, it's uh, Nehemiah Gordon, and he does a good teaching on that about the pronunciation of his name. And you can find that uh, on Nehemiah's wall on the, uh, what was in the trash box at the Vatican. Okay. And, and, and I've read some of his writings and, uh, you know, I like some of what he puts out. You just have to remember he's a Karite Jew. Right. So he's going to reject any of rabbinic writings. He says the Mishnah isn't, doesn't have any validation, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, right. each sect is going to have uh, degrees or texts that they're going to accept or say, well, that's just a sectarian writing. Right. Well, that's, uh, well, I'm just saying, too, for Yahweh's, uh, Yeho uh, Yehovah's, pronunciation of his name that's all i'm sure saying. sure not a problem check out I, what he has to I, say yeah i do check i have and i do agree with him because i've been i found that out 20 years ago and i okay, call you a lot of people have a problem with um like is oral torah valid no and of course if you, if you listen to an Orthodox Jewish thing, he's going to say, well, that's the whole Talmud, it's the Gemara, it's the Mishnah. You know, it's the same way as every single word of text that we have in a modern day Bible. Is that directly from God or is a lot of it from man? Absolutely not. For so you have to look at it in the same light. We should be the good money changers and understand what is good scripture and what is false scripture. And I say a lot of rabbinical teachings are good teachings. Do sure. not get me wrong. And I do follow by, by a few uh, uh, rabbinical teachings that are oral Torah, but to replace it with the original Torah, no, I think that's heresy. Well, didn't uh, Yeshua, this is from, in fact, uh, um, you know, we covered a little bit of this on some posts. Rich had a little bit on it, but, uh, and I typed in, it's from Yochanan or John chapter uh, 5, verse 46. Yeshua is speaking here. And he says, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me. He wrote about me. That's right. Okay. But then he says, but if you did not believe his writings, how do you not believe my oral Torah? my words. Right. And so what Yeshua spoke, what we call the New Testament, do you want to say that Yeshua wrote it all like the Moshiach redemption or was his words oral Torah and most of what he was discussing, he was arguing oral Torah with the other sects 
plural of Judaism's plural that existed at the time of the uh, first century. Well, he definitely went against them for the oral Torah because of the, you know, the part about the scripture about washing the hands and um, all that. Uh, and then it goes on, uh, not do what they do, not do what they do. The ones that sit in Moses' seat. Uh, um, I mean, Nehemiah Gordon's got another teaching on that in uh, Hebrew Matthew. Well, he's going to be anti-oral Torah, so there's another way to look at that. So did, did the Talmudim of, of Yeshua wash their hands before they eat, but they didn't do it in the rabbinic way and say, you know, like the blessing, the way. No, the he said they didn't wash their hands at all. Said. Yeah, so, he, they, uh, the rabbi said they didn't wash their hands at all. So uh, I, I come to the conclusion that they wasn't following by the rabbinical uh, teaching of the oral Torah. That's not wholly true. I mean, and of course, Nehemiah Gordon's going to come at it from a perspective of anti-oral Torah. So you have uh, to take that with a sec, a second grain of thought. Now, the the washing of hands is is a rabbinic commandment, and there are seven of those. And the Jewish people are open on that. I mean, the lighting of two candles on the Shabbat—that's a rabbinic. Uh, the washing of the hands is, but actually, if you read in the Hebrew, not the translation, when you do a blessing for washing the hands, it actually, the blessing isn't for washing, and because it does not have the word rochetz in it, it uses the word al lot, and that means for the raising up of hands. So what it means is that I'm coming clean before you, the blessing isn't for the actual washing. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to be careful because the translation, even even in my Siddur, it says for the washing of hands, but I look over and it doesn't say rohats. It says for the raising up of hands. I'm coming clean before you to eat a covenant meal. That's right. what you're really saying in the Hebrew. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I feel myself that the... Uh, Orthodox Jews have built such a fence around the Torah that n no Gentile could even come close to even uh, doing what they want or what the, what it requires. So we should uh, we should I, I I don't think that we should pay attention to the oral Torah at all. Maybe get some aspects from it to follow by. It's a good guidance, but the Following of the oral tour, I do think Yeshua was against that completely because of the making I up of God. I disagree with you totally on that, but whatever. Everything Yeshua said is oral Torah. So you're going to believe oral Torah by one rabbi, but not by anybody else, right? That's what you're saying. No, no. Well, hold on. Let me, let me jump in here, guys. Just a, let me jump in here just a second. There's a couple of things I'd like to say. One is, is that... Uh, uh, I would not say that the oral Torah is completely void of any uh, anything that can help us. Absolutely. Uh, I'm I'm actually going through a study right now where you know, and it's talking about the difference uh, or, or the possibilities that the um, the Talmud mentions um, Yeshua. And so even the even if they mention him in a positive or negative light or whatever it is, it shows right, that, that that Yeshua was a real person that existed. Uh, mm -hmm. so it, 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 it breaks down the argument of some of the secular, um, some of the secular academics that, Hey, he was not even a real person when we have in the Talmud them speaking about him. Secondly, um, I would say that, you know, you guys are using two different terms. Scott, when he says, when you say oral Torah means anything that was orally ever said about the Torah and you are saying, Oh, the Talmud, uh, you know, including the Mishnah and uh, uh, and all of that, the Babylonian Talmud, and also um, the other one. I can't think; it escapes me. Um, Yerushalami Talmud. Right, and so um, so you you guys are using a term, but you guys have different definitions for the term. Yeah, yeah that's true. So that's, that's going to bring a little bit of disagreement when there's not necessarily disagreement. But I mean, it's obvious that Scott is going to find a lot more valuable information in the Talmud than you are uh yes. is that your name uh john yes and so um i would say this from from my i mean you know how many we've got four eight tw uh, 
12, 14 people in here. So we probably got 18 different opinions on Holy Torah or on uh, oral Torah. Um, and, uh, and I know I have a bunch of different things that if I said, Hey, this is what I believe, then everybody in here would almost be like, Oh no, I've never heard that. What's that? That's crazy. And then you guys have your own and we would all think it's crazy and all that. I think what has to bind us together is, is that number one, and where I would lean with John is, is that we follow the Messiah. The Messiah is the most important. He Amen. is the preeminent. And so I think it's a little bit of an obfuscation by Scott. And I know I understand Scott's heart. He has a heart for the Jewish people. He has a heart to see them come to Messiah. And, and I get that. Uh, I get that completely. But, you know, uh, it, it's hard to say, hey, uh, they're looking for the Messiah to come. And so that's almost like them, you know, uh, believing in Yeshua, quote unquote, but really it isn't because we've got, because they're, they're disregarding his words up until this day. Now, might they and their kids and these people that are, that are studying this stuff out and really looking for the Messiah and looking back like John said, uh, like John pointed out and Scott said they were at, Hey, the temple got destroyed. So they were looking at the Messiah before the temple, at least, at least the Messiah being you know, safe. Yes, absolutely. But I, I don't think we want to go too far and say they're okay. Um, they're at a, they're at a place that's okay in Elohim's eyes. I think that they might be, um, that the journey that they're on, because we all started a different journey, um, might be great in Elohim's eyes. But the the ultimate goal, uh, the end point, is to accept the right guy as Messiah. I mean, that's that's because if we're supposed to listen to him uh, in his oral Torah of Moshe, then um, then we really need to um, we need to make sure that we do keep that at the forefront of what we're doing. And, and so, and that leads me back to whether it's part is, or, uh, you know, the whole thing, and you're talking about so level and this level and that level, the ultimate thing is, is that the easiest word, the, the most plain words are the easiest to understand. And we're even told that the, one of the reasons that most Moshe is second on the list. And I just did the video. I'll post it uh, tomorrow. Um, if, and Moses is second on the list of who you're supposed to listen to behind the Messiah is because he speaks words that are easy to understand. And that's, that's an important point. I think a lot of us miss is that we're trying to get this prophetic vision or this, this mysterion or this, whatever it is. And when, when the Bible itself said the most important words are the ones that are easiest to understand. So are there prophetic meanings of stuff? Yes, there are. Are those valuable in certain arenas? Yes, there are. But for day, yes, they are. But for day to day living, the Messiah explicitly said, you will be judged according to your works. You love the father, you love your neighbor. <clears throat> when they ask him, who is your neighbor? He, he wrangled up one of the most despicable people that they could think of and said, <laughs> that guy's your neighbor. Amen. And so, so our theology can be different, and that's good. That's what this forum is about. But our actions need not be. Our actions need to be that we love the Father, we love our neighbor, and we don't spend more time, and we don't spend more effort, and we don't think of ways to get the latest mysterious interpretation of Enoch chapter four versus feeding our neighbor when they need some food. Amen. Right. And so I think, I, I think it's a good cap to, to put on it to say, I love these discussions. I love to hear Scott's perspective and John, you came out firing that that was awesome. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, quoting different people, you know, quoting the Hamia and, and go into different, uh, what was it? as a, as a com and, and you got to take all that stuff with a grain of salt, but just looking sure. at all of this stuff and trying to, to incorporate a, a theological, um, um, a theological paradigm is good, but don't let that paradigm turn you into someone who doesn't do, do good works to his neighbor. Amen. Well, yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, you know, obviously, and the Judaism will agree with you on that, that, uh, you know, you've got to go out and be a doer. You've got to show your faith, you, you know, by your actions. And of course, James or Yaakov, it should be called Yaakov. He states that very thing, you know, you, you show me your works, you know, you show me your faith without good works, mitzvot, good deeds. 
that are, you know, and that's what the Torah does. It's telling you what the good deeds are and which, what are the bad deeds. You know, I can't, I'm going to go out and show you my, my belief, my faith, my emunah, which is a verb, faith in Hebrew, rather than a noun. I'm going to show it by my works. So, you know, I, I agree with you 100% on that part of it. I, um, I as well agree 100%. Um, right. So we're, we're all at different levels of learning, and I'm coming from a, a Jewish point of view. I'm Jewish. I'm giving you an Orthodox point of view. I don't always agree with everything the rabbis say. Um, I'm not supposed to do that. In Judaism, questions are good, and we can overlook different viewpoints provided that we, we come together as one in what we have in common, and we're always learning, we're always trying to seek. I mean, the Torah is God's righteousness and the righteousness of his Messiah. None of us are going to keep it all. We're all going to come short. But what does the Torah do then? It illuminates when we come short. So um, are, are we saved by keeping Torah? Nope. But um, is the Torah the standard of righteousness that points us towards God and his Zeroah, his right arm, his Messiah? Yes. Um, but the Torah itself doesn't save you. Keeping Torah doesn't save you. It's by faith. It's not the oh, words of, of the Torah that save you or teaches you. It's the spirit that shall be your teacher. Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can, you can say the New Testament is scripture or not. I, I see it as commentary on the, the Tanakh. I mean, it's inspired commentary. Not every word that's written there is inspired, but most of it is. I mean, what did Shaul say? People will take this wrong, but in Romans chapter 3, at the verses 1 and 2, what advantage has the Jew or what profit is there to be circumcised? Much in every way, mainly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. So in some ways, the Jew has a huge advantage, but then he goes on to say, hey, you know, you Gentiles have a position as well. We each need to say, hey, let's take a step back and figure out how we can join together towards one goal. Right. Now, Scott, can I jump in again? Uh, I just, because I think we just kind of came full circle again because it's a given that you live toward. You know, you have to have works and faith. And I think both sides see that and it's biblically upheld in both writing. But we're back to... If, if Messiah and David and Messiah and Joseph are the same Messiah, so, mm -hmm. and if, if we are two houses and there is a Messiah, so to speak, for each house. Now, if you take the parable of the older brother, let's say, you know, and Yeshua's parable, and, and Judah is the older brother, and he says, look at, you know, you've always been with me. You know, you're still in the house. You, you don't need. Yep. See, my thing would be, and this is what I'd like to establish, at least in my own mind, this is where I am. I don't think the Jews need to accept Messiah Ben Joseph for salvation's sake, if they are a believing in the Messiah righteous Jew, because their promises for the king is a Messiah Ben David. Their promise in the Olam Haba, you know, and they believe that in, in of the kingdom. So <clears throat> if we, so we're back to square one, we're back to the early church, we're back to like, how do we put, how do we have relationship with each other that pleases the father? together Ephraim and Joseph there's a verse in Isaiah that I've been studying lately very interesting that says that you know that Ephraim will no longer be jealous of Judah and Judah will no longer vex Ephraim or I got it back but something like that and Rashi kind of says basically Messiah and Joseph will not be jealous of Messiah and David and Messiah and David will not be like in other words they'll figure it out It'll, there'll be peace between the two sort of that so I'd like to establish to my mind are we past the point where we have to demand that the Jews receive Messiah and Joseph and see Jesus the way we see Jesus when they don't, Yeshua, when they don't need to in the, in the same way we do. Well, they do. When, when he comes as Messiah ben David, they're going to have to acknowledge that he was Messiah ben Yosef all along. And you have Zechariah 12.10 that tells but, you they're going to yeah. mourn for the one who was pierced. They're going right. to say, my goodness, how could we have not known that? But you know, Everything that the Jew did, it's, it's an example for us. 
people go, well, those Jews rejected Jesus. You can't make that blanket statement. Right. If you out and out reject Yeshua, but, but the Jews mostly have not done that. They just said, well, let's wait and see. We're not sure. Uh, the way the Messiah has been presented by the Gentiles, he's not Torah observant. How could he be? He can't be the Messiah, that Jesus. They don't even live the Torah. Every day we're seeing them. They, they know the Torah is forever, but they're going, the Gentile, they aren't even observing the part of the Torah that applies to them. So why should we believe that this Jesus is our Messiah? Right, and that's I mean, a legit you got to look at it from both place, both points of view. Now, right. If you, if you came at it from believing Yeshua is the Messiah, you're going to primarily say, well, the words of Jesus are way more important. They outweigh the Torah. But what you have to do is you have to meld it together and you have to say, wait a second, there can't be any contradictions between right. what we call the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's our understanding that's a contradiction, not right. what's written in Scripture. I don't see the contradictions. There's a few that I haven't solved. There's a few that won't be solved till the Messiah comes back. But if you really look, it's just like I've, I've read through the whole Mishnah many times. I use it on the radio. I study. Do I put it above the Torah? No. I don't see contradictions very many there at all. But you have to have a deep Torah understanding to even comprehend. So most of what the Gentiles think are contradictions, they're not there. They aren't. If you, do, if you really research, but I'm talking 40, 50 hours of study on one subject to realize there's not a contradiction. It isn't just reading some paperback book by what some guy thinks he said, or right, going or on a website, the reading by, you know, They don't have to keep the law, you know, and we're not understanding the whole scope of the discussion. But my last question, if I can, because, so how do you, what is your eschatology, Scott? Seriously, how do you see, uh, or what do you see <laughs> coming upon the world that a would maybe unify the two houses let's just say i mean i know this is probably conspiracy you know let's just say a quote unquote i mean the aliens show up what would unite us what could be or do you see that there will be something that is beyond our control that could unite us or how do you see the going into the millennium i guess what is your eschatology okay first thing i'm going to say is messiah ben david is going to be the one that unites us okay and uh, the Jews know it, and the Christians know it. Right, I mean, that's, right. that's really obvious, okay? Um, I'll tell you what's going to unite the, the different sects of Judaism, the rebuilding of the temple. And it is. It's the We're one thing you know. that's uniting them, and it's necessary. You know, people go, well, that's the Antichrist temple or, okay. and all of that. No, it isn't. Yeshua, it's a valid temple, even though they may not acknowledge everything or not see the deeper meaning. Yeshua says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. So it doesn't happen until the middle of the, of the Shavuah. So it's a legit temple. He's calling it a holy place. And he says, you're standing there in it. He goes, then flee, then flee. So it's a legit temple until it's defiled, just like happened in the first temple, the second temple. You know, it's the same thing with the argument of Hanukkah. Um, it, Hanukkah was observed and set by Haggai hundreds of years before the, Ma the Magi. He gives the exact date. Um, Psalm 30, the title is Hanukkah. I mean, so you have to understand it means dedication. It's not talking about uh, lighten uh, uh, Hanukkah today or talking about a, a midrash about oil. Um, the Temple Institute has established that that amount of pure oil with the right wick will burn for eight days every time. They already know that. They've proven it. So it's not about the oil. It's not even totally about the Maccabees. It's about assimilation into pagan society and not maintaining the faith of the Torah. You know what's the greatest danger to Judaism isn't the Hitlers or the Antiochus the four. It's assimilation. It's it's Laban the Aramean who said, "Just come and be like us, marry our daughters." And if you have ever gone through a Passover Seder, it it specifically tells you that there's going to be things in every generation that come against us. And consider Laban the Aramean. That's the subtle way to do away with the Torah, the customs, 
the the and all of that. It's the Hitlers are obvious. Well, the, as far as eschatology, you know, it's basically in in Judaism, the what Christians call the tribulation. They think that there would be the days of the Messiah, and that whether they believe in a, a gathering or a rapture or they're taken out or they go through the tribulation, that's not important. But in Judaism, they see the first seven years is part of the millennial kingdom. And there are two aspects you have to look at the scripture and see that just as David was king in Hebron for the first seven years while Saul was still reigning, then he came to Jerusalem and reigned for 33 more years. That's how they're seeing it, is that the tribulation is the first seven years. It's like going into two movie theaters. One of you is going into a beautiful love story and a wedding and a coronation of a king. And then the other theater is about war and death and the wars of Gog and Magog and Armageddon and the battle for Jerusalem and Sheba and Eden. And so there's two theaters. And we don't differentiate between that. So the day of the Lord depends on where you are. I don't know if I made sense on that. I mean, that's a, a hundred hour teaching. To comprehend. Yeah, I know. That, but, but that was an interesting, what you said about the temple. So you do believe, you know, literally, you don't think that there's the spiritual temple, you know, the concept that. Well, there's uh, both. Both. Right. So that you, but the, you know, the Peshat level, so there does have to, you believe that there is going to be a physical temple that will um, have to okay, come Okay, just for example, okay, you know, people will take Paul's words and they'll say, don't you know that we are the temple? Huh, Paul's not saying anything new there. That's, that's a common Judaism belief. In fact, if you understand the temple and in the Hakal or what people call the holy place, you have the showbread the menorah, and uh, you have the incense altar. Well, the incense altar has to do with the nose. The menorah has to do with the light of the eyes, and the bread has to do with the mouth. It's the face. Yom Kippur is called the face, face to face. You meet face to face with God on one day a year, and that's when your willful sin is, is forgiven. All the other offerings are for sins of ignorance and unwillful sin. No offering ever um, was valid without repentance. Um, and so, you know, that's what the prophet said. Your kavanah, your attitude is wrong. You didn't repent. God doesn't want those offerings. All you're doing is slaughtering animals. Um, but here's the book, The Wisdom of the Hebrew Months, written by a rabbi. He says, just as the Mishkan, or temple, became the resting place for the Shekinah, which means the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, in the wilderness, so too the Jewish people bound to its origins and created by the Kerashim, continue to be the host of Hashem's presence. We are the living Mishkan. So that's a common understanding. So it's both. You are a temple, but that does not negate a physical temple. The word sacrifice shouldn't even be in the Bible. It should be korban. Kuf resh bet means to draw near to Hashem. How do you draw near? Through repentance. That's it. Period. Right. Well, that's good stuff. Oh my gosh, God! I, you just made it, it's going to get more dicey, not less. I I've think. been teaching this for two hours every week on Hebrew Nation Radio for four years now with Joseph Good, who's one of the greatest temple <laughs> scholars, non-Jewish. All of the Jewish rabbis of the Temple Institute acknowledge it, and uh, we've actually been able to help the Jewish people to understand portions of the Torah because they're coming at it from too much of a Jewish aspect. Who helped build the first temple and the second temple? Gentiles were involved. Now, were they actually up on the Temple Mount erecting it? No, they were aiding the Jews so that they could fulfill the portion of Torah that applied to them. Can I, uh, you can do. Can I, uh, you don't need to worry about the temple yourself if you're non-Jewish. The other thing I see today, I'm sorry I'm taking over and I'll shut up after this, but uh, is that somehow there's like we have the, the one house theory, the two house theory, and somehow a lot of people today say, well, you must be of Ephraim, but we see that the two houses are joined together. We don't know who all of Ephraim is, 
But we also see um, non-Jews in the temple. So who's the non-Jews that are believers that are allowed to go in the millennium? So whether we know we're of the house of Yosef or, or Ephraim or we're of Yehuda or not, um, there are still going to be 70 nations who join with Israel during the millennium. So I wouldn't say that every believer is of the house of Ephraim. That's the only thing. I, but there is a two-house theory, and I agree that's true. I'll uh, shut up. Can I say something? Go for it. <laughs> I've talked too long. Uh, Make it fast. Uh, uh, hold on. Let my microphone. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to go on. Okay. You want to try it now? Talk loud. Hello? Hello? Better. I'm sorry, I got cut off. Yeah, I got cut off. I'm done. He's done. Yeah, I'm done. John's done. I don't know if I'm even on now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't know what happened to Rich, but our, we're out of time. And so I want to thank you all for coming again. It, it was a lovely discussion. I learned an awful lot here, and some of this stuff I'll never learn. Thank you all for being on, and I guess we continue on again next Shabbat at 1 o'clock. And Try to come to the service if you can at 11 o'clock. Uh, that's Eastern time. Be with us then as well. And until we meet again, may Yahweh be with you. And if we don't see you in this world, we'll see you in the next. Thank you, especially, Scott. Shabbat shalom. Shalom.